I'd like to introduce to you Dr. David Whartonby. David retired as a full professor of biology from Kenai Peninsula College in 2015 after 18 years. He has a PhD, a master's, and a bachelor's in biology. When he was here with us, um, we called him the Renaissance man, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, only the most outstanding university professors are given the title of emeritus. David is a UAA KPC professor emeritus, and even though the emeritus title is rare, he was also bestowed the emeritus title upon his retirement from East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania in 1997. Being named emeritus twice at two different universities is pretty much unheard of. David has a Juris Doctor degree, he's a lawyer, and is a member of the Alaska Bar Association. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer for two years in Senegal, West Africa, was a certified paramedic, and a member of the National Ski Patrol for 30 years. <clears throat> he serves as a board member and a volunteer for the Tustamina 200 sled dog race and has helped at Iditarod checkpoints. He's also been the head cabbage wrangler at the Alaska State Fair for a number of years. He has curated three wildlife art shows for the Kenai Visitor Center, meaning he arranged and selected the artists and original artwork for the shows that were done by the very best wildlife artists in the world. And he personally knows many of them. They were wonderful shows. David is also a private pilot and is qualified on floats and skis. He has piloted planes from Alaska to the lower 48 on three cross-country trips. He does considerable research, and he's going to talk to you about that when he teaches, on the small bugs called coronamids and discuss their importance today, why they're so important to the Kenai River and other streams. <clears throat> he's discover, discovered a number of new ones in the Kenai River. <clears throat> the main reason he's perfect for this class is because he fishes. He's an angler. He doesn't just research the resource. He's out there fishing for salmon or fly fishing for trout. Most students after they take this part of the course say, I'll never look at a stream or river the same way again. Well, hello, I'm Dr. David Whartonby and I'm going to be talking about stream ecology. What I'm gonna try and do today is I'm going to try and teach a full graduate course in stream ecology in about two and a half hours. So I'm going to have to talk fast. You're going to have to pay attention. And I'm going to jump around to a bunch of different ideas. I also have another colleague who will be joining me to talk about salmon issues and salmon and so on. So you're going to get a double-barreled version of, of this stream ecology uh, ideas today. Let me tell you a little bit about myself so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, I have a bachelor's and a master's and a doctoral degree in biology. My area of expertise is streams and stream ecology. I did my master's thesis and doctoral thesis on stream ecology. Since then, I've been a university professor. Uh, done that for 40 years. Uh, I have another series of variety of backgrounds. I did a lot of rescue work and emergency first aid work as an EMT and paramedic in the streets for 17 years. Uh, I've been a National Ski Patroller. I spend a lot of time outdoors. And uh, in my other times when I'm not doing that, I'm also an attorney at, and admitted to the bar in Pennsylvania and Alaska. So I have a really bizarre background. And we'll call on that as we go along. Uh, I'm also an admitted geek in that you know I like math and physics and, and so on. And I'm going to talk about some of the physics that's going on and relate it to the biology that we're going to be talking about. Because, as I said, we're going to try and talk about stream ecology today. So the basic thing that we have here in front of us is basic stream ecology. And I'm going to start with the idea of what's called trophic relationships. Now, that's a big fancy 50 cent word. That simply means what's for lunch. Trophic means eating. And we want to look at the relationships between who's eating who and how they're doing it and how that impacts each other, OK? So if we were to kind of try to graphically show that, we can just kind of go through a series of pictures. The first picture is of a diatom. And that's uh, 
just to kind of give you a perspective, that's been magnified 3,000 times with a scanning electron microscope. And they get fed upon by Daphne and small crustacean creatures. And then from there, we have those creatures can be fed upon by insects, which in turn then can feed, be fed on by larger insects. And eventually, we get to what we're here about, and that is we're interested in fish. Okay, Maybe I didn't tell you, but I'm also an avid fisherman. Uh, all year round, whether it's salt, fresh water, ice, it doesn't matter. I'm out there fishing, and we're interested in the fish. So that's kind of the, the basic idea from which we're going to try and approach all of this. So we've got that basic food web, but we need to talk about some other things. When I go to look at a stream, and I've been fortunate enough to have worked on streams in South America, throughout the United States and Alaska, and all kinds of other places too, and the first question I ask whenever I see a stream is, where did the energy come from that drives that stream? Now, maybe that seems like an esoteric question, and certainly one that those of us who are geeks would, would ask. But why are we really interested in that? Well, remember that every organism that's there has to eat something. And what do they eat? And where did that food come from? And so we kind of look backwards to see where did the energy come from, OK? And there's a number of places it could come from in a stream, and it could be in the form of algae. Now, I'm saying algae or diatoms. These are photosynthetic organisms. Now, photosynthesis is something that when you're probably, if we're learning this in high school, it probably scared you to try and try to, try to understand what photosynthesis is all about. But let me tell you very simply what it is. Photosynthesis is a process that certain organisms can do it. We call them plants or algae or photosynthesizers. What they can do is that they can take carbon dioxide and they can take water and combine them together into a very simple sugar and then combine those into bigger sugars. That's what photosynthesis is all about. And that's what these guys can do. And so we're interested in the sunlight that we have giving the power to cause that photosynthesis. And that's what algae do. They get their power from the light. Or, and so do plants and any other organisms that are doing it. And we're going to see a whole gamut of them right now. So these little creatures here, the algae or diatoms that I have pictured, uh, and you probably can't read the magnification, but when I took this picture with a scanning electron microscope, it was about 3,300 magnifications. So you can get the idea that these are really, really tiny. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't know anything about these. How would I know about an algae that's that small? Well, if you're like me and you spent time walking to a stream, what happens is sometime or another you have slipped and fallen into the water. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't, your time's coming. But I've been there way too many times. But the reason that I slipped was that I stepped on some diatoms because diatoms have a gelatinous coating on them. It's very slippery. So when you walk into a stream and it's slippery on the rocks, it's because of those diatoms that are there. They are photosynthesizing, OK? So there's one place the energy could be coming from, from these guys. Perhaps it could be from some of the smaller plants that are in there, that are in the water. So here's a picture of the, this is the Swanson River, OK? And in the Swanson River, you've got all kinds of different plants that are emergent. We call these emergent vegetation. And these are things like, well, there's nymphaea, there's nymph. Uh, New far in the water is Eleocharis and all kinds of other plants that are photosynthesizing. Just in the same way, using the same chemical processes as what those diatoms are doing, but now we can see them. They're big enough that you can see them, OK? All right, so there's a lot of that going on in streams. And then we have another source of energy in our streams. And this is one that is one that perhaps takes a little bit more of explanation. And that's the riparian areas. And when I say riparian, what I'm talking about is the areas around the stream. Around the stream, and this, by the way, is a picture of Quartz Creek. If you haven't ever fished Quartz Creek, you're in for a treat. So make sure you get there sometime this fall. Uh, it is a fabulous place for rainbows and, of course, uh, dollies as well. But in this particular situation, what you have is leaves coming in from the surrounding vegetation. You may not realize this, but the average tree has between 250,000 and 650,000 leaves in it. And where are those leaves going to end up in the fall? They're, most of them are going to end up in that stream. And that's an input of organic material that comes into the stream. So it's come from outside the stream but it's coming from that riparian area. And those riparian areas are very, very important. And we'll be learning that as we go along. So these are three different places that you could have your energy coming from in a stream. Now, 
what happens is that most streams don't have just one of these. They don't have multiples. This is a picture of the Anchor River, not too far from us. Very productive stream. And you'll find that what you have is riparian vegetation all around it. Lots of, you can see cottonwood trees, and then there's plants inside and emerging out of the water. And if you take a walk in there, you'll find it's slippery. So there's lots of diatoms and algae there. And so you've got all three in combinations of those. And depending upon those combinations, you, know, you have different types of, of stream productivity. In fact, just as a comment for you as we go along, the most productive streams that you're going to see here in Alaska are ones that have a great deal of riparian vegetation. Those are the ones that have the most number of fish, that have the most number of insects, and so on. And that has the statement that they're the most productive streams. All right, now let's take a look at some places where we have differing amounts of riparian vegetation. So here's an example. This happens to be the Toad River on the Alcan Highway. And you look at that, you see all the rocks surrounding it, and there's no riparian vegetation there whatsoever. I mean, it's just almost devoid of riparian vegetation. So this is not a particularly productive stream. However, I will tell you that I took a bath in this stream one time when I was fishing because it was so slippery, covered by all of the diatoms. So in this case, there's not very much. Now, if you go up and take a ride up to Dead Horse and go up Adigan Pass, this is what you're going to see. You're going to cross this particular stream as you go along. And you see there's a little bit more vegetation around it, but not much, OK? What we're dealing with here in the Kenai River is this. We have lots and lots of riparian vegetation around. And imagine if each one of those trees has 250 to 650,000 leaves, how many leaves are going to end up in the Kenai River. And they're going to have a major impact. That's a major input of energy into our streams. And, and I want to tell you about that because that leaf input is going to have a huge, huge impact that we probably don't even realize until we look at it in a little bit different way. Those leaves coming in are essentially dried, dead leaves. In fact, I have a job for you. I want you to go out and find a whole handful of leaves, if you dig around maybe under the snow or whatever, and take a handful of those leaves and chew on them and see how much nutritive value you get. You know how much you get? zippity doo -dah. Nothing. Absolutely nothing because it's all cellulose. And you and I, as animals, do not have enzymes in our digestive tract that can break down cellulose. In fact, there are no animals that can break down cellulose. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, what about a moose? What about a cow? They just eat vegetation. Well, yeah, but you know what? They have bacteria and fungi in their gut that breaks down the cellulose. The animal itself can't produce the enzyme, only the bacteria and fungi, okay? So here comes these, this load of leaves, and they are essentially a nutritional desert when they first arrive. But within a very short period of time, what happens is that they end up getting bacteria and fungi on them. In fact, there's a lot of research that was done back when I was a graduate student where they were looking at how fast did we get a growth of, of bacteria and fungi and how much protein changed and what kind of chemical changes occurred in those leaves. And in a very short period of time, about two or three days, the leaves are now covered with fungi and bacteria. And they're breaking down that cellulose because they have the enzymes to do it. And now insects and other organisms can break down and utilize that as a source of food. So maybe if you want to think of these leaves now as being kind of a tasteless cracker, and on the tasteless cracker is a load of peanut butter, like that of in perhaps now in the form of bacteria and fungi that has lots of protein and is now nutritionally valuable for these insects and these organisms. So it becomes an attractive food source once it's been in the stream for a number of days. Probably three to four days is what it'll take. And now, who does that? Who's interested in those leaves? And I'm showing you a little picture of a little tiny organism in the bottom of the picture here, and it looks like some strange little worm. Well, that's what they look like. They're about an inch long. They're about uh, maybe at the most an eighth of an inch thick. And you can't really tell, but the bulbous end is the back end of the organism. And they use that to lodge themselves in the leaves. And then the other end is where they feed their way through the leaves, breaking up the leaves and chopping them up. They chop them up and eat those and digest away some of the proteins from the fungi and from the bacteria. Okay. 
And along the way, of course, our leaves get broken up into little tiny pieces. Now, this crazy thing that we're looking at is something you've probably never seen. And, and I'm not surprised because they're buried in the leaf packs and you probably aren't digging in the leaf packs very much. However, you might recognize this guy. It looks like a, mos like a mosquito on steroids. This giant creature that's an inch long or longer or bigger in terms of its body length is a crane fly. Okay? And the crane fly is the adult. Now, if you look at that and you think, oh my goodness, this thing's a mosquito. If it bites me, it's going to just, you know, my arm's going to turn into a weathered limb. Well, no, they don't feed when they're adults. They only feed when they're larvae, and they don't feed as adults, and so you don't have to worry about it. But when you see these large crane flies buzzing around all summer long, these are the adults of the larvae that were breaking down those leaves into little tiny pieces. Okay? Now, let's go on. There's some others that are doing this. In fact, there's a lot of creatures that are doing this as well. There are some stoneflies, some very interesting stoneflies. If you're interested in fly fishing, a black nymph, Plocopteran nymph, is a very, very good uh, nymph to use in the Kenai River drainages and Anchor River because these particular creatures are there. They look like this guy, and they are about... Uh, well, about an inch long. Unfortunately, because of the way we're doing our presentations today, rather than me being in front of you and being able to hand you a, a little vial with some of these creatures in them, which is what I would normally do, uh, you're just going to have to say, well, I, I'll believe you that there's this creature that's really black and, and it's a black stonefly, and it chops up leaves as well. It takes the leaves that are now covered with with fungi and bacteria and chops them up into little tiny pieces. And you've heard me say that, chopping up into little tiny pieces several times because therein is something very, very important. Because what happens is that those little tiny pieces of leaves are now going to become critically important. They make little tiny pieces or what we could call small detritus. If you're in a stream somewhere and you see the water level start to pick up suddenly after a spate or some rain or whatever, and you see a little, seems like a little bit of dirt or cloudiness, if you take a very fine mesh net and put it in and collect some of that and put it under a microscope, what you're finding are little tiny leaf fragments. That's what that discoloration is. It's leaf fragments that have been chopped up and passed through the gut of these insects. We call this group of insects, in fact, the gilded insects, we call them shredders because they chop up the leaves into little tiny pieces. Okay? Now, what I need you to understand is that these little tiny pieces are nutrient rich. They've got lots of diatoms on them now. They've got algae. They've got all of that fungi. They've got the bacteria. And that's a really good food source for everybody. Well, not everybody, but for lots and lots of organisms. Some of those organisms are going to use those little tiny pieces are things like this guy. Now, this is called a cyclops. He's little tiny. He is just barely visible with the naked eye in, for the human body. You and I can see them, but just barely. You know, it's like a little teeny weeny BB. But they feed on little tiny pieces of leaf fragments. And of course, why do we care about these guys? Well, later on, you're going to see how little tiny salmon relish these little creatures that are just very, very tiny. OK? Another guy. This is a very fascinating one. This is a caddisfly. This is the most abundant caddisfly in the Kenai River. It's in the, fam or in the genus uh, Brachiocentris, family Brachiocentridae. It makes a very characteristic squared or log cabin case, and they sit in the water and face into the stream, facing upriver, and on their legs, they have little tiny hairs that we can't really see, but in this diagram you can get the idea of how they sit. And they hold their arms up like this with the hairs hanging down and the little tiny particles collect on there. Now I'm hoping that we're going to be able to show you a video of some Brachiocentris caddisflies sitting there with their legs up in the air, checking and catching for little particles, and finally one catches a particle and then takes it in and eats it. Okay, I'm hoping we're going to be able to see that. Uh, if we can make it happen, we will, okay? So this is another feeder on those little tiny, little tiny fragments of leaves. Remember, this is the most abundant caddisfly that you see in the Kenai River. By the way, starting in June and July, you'll start seeing little gray caddisflies flying upstream. That's who these guys are, okay? All right, 
Here's another guy that's very commonly feeding on these particles, and these are known as scuds. If you're a fly tire, you look for fly patterns that are for scuds. Uh, they are related to shrimp, and so you know they're really we know them as amphipods. But these guys will feed on little tiny leaf particles as well, and we'll find these in any stream and every stream you go to feeding on little tiny organic particles that are there. Uh, if you're a, an ice fisherman in the lakes in, in the uh, area here, what you'll find is that you'll probably use shrimp as bait. Why? Because it looks like shrimp, and these are what these guys are feeding. Open up a fish when you catch one in the wintertime, and you'll see they're loaded with these small little scuds or amphipods. Okay, But again, what do they feed on? They feed on little tiny organic particles, and particularly these leaf fragments that have been formed by the leaves getting chopped up. Here's another guy that's feeding on these leaf particles, and this is one that you've probably never seen this version or this view. This is the head end of a black fly larva. Now, black fly larvas are very small. They're only probably a quarter of an inch long totally as a larva, and then as and we call them white socks. These are the ones that crawl up underneath your sleeve and bite you, and you don't even know they've bitten you until you see some blood dripping down your arm. That's the black flies. They're very pesky, buzzing around your face in areas. Uh, but as a larva, they feed on little tiny leaf fragments. And these antennal fans that you see displayed here are held up into the current, and they hold and capture some of those little fragments, and then they bring them into their mouth and feed on them. So once again, this is another organism very abundant in our Kenai River and in our areas, the Kenai River drainages. You'll find that these black flies are very common. Now I could go on for a long time talking about these insects, but I'll quit for now and we're going to move on to some other areas. We do have to take a break because of the timing on the camera, so we'll just take a break for a second. All right, after that technical uh, mechanical break, we're going to try and show you a video uh, that I have in front of me now uh, that is of a bunch of Brachiocentris caddisflies that are looking into the current and moving along. And we're going to hope that we're able to edit those in. Right now, we can't, I can't make it move on my screen, but trust me that if we get to see it, you'll be able to identify that the Brachiocentris caddisflies are catching something that you didn't see and that was something that they were feeding on. Remember, they're catching these with, with hairs that are on the side of their legs. By the way, lots and lots of other insects, like the mayflies and so on, are doing the same kind of thing, okay? All right, there are some other creatures that are feeding on these fine particles, and this is one that is a very uh, fairly common one. It's called Artopsyche. It's in the family Hydropsychidae. Uh, it's a caddisfly, and you may not realize this about caddisflies, but they are closely related to, uh, to moths. And what happens is that moths have the ability to, sil to spin silk or produce silk, and so do these guys. These can make silk that they use to glue their cases together, to glue pebbles together, or twigs like in the Brachiocentris. Instead, these particular caddisflies, this Arctopsyche, spin a net. They actually are fishing for their fine particles. They build a net, and the net is extended out into the water, and the water goes drifting by, and the fine particles get captured in there, and they feed on the fine particles. So the idea is that we're going to try and show you a video. Again, we're putting another little uh, video clip in here. And from what we're seeing, what I can see now, not much moving, not very exciting. But when the, when the clip sh uh, is run, what you'll see is a, a caddisfly with a fine little net that's kind of in a little bulbous net that's full of water that has been capturing leaf fragments. And the, and the caddisfly is then going along the surface of that and picking off the fine fragments of leaves that he caught. So this is, again, another organism and another way of capturing those little tiny leaf fragments, which, again, remember, they came from the riparian vegetation because that's where it all came from.
Now, there are some other creatures that are going to be doing other things uh, and feeding on these leaf particles and on other parts. Uh, so we want to kind of get a, uh, an overall view of, remember, who's eating who or what's for lunch. So some, some of our organisms are going to be scraping rocks. There's a group of caddisflies called the glossosomata. They're little tiny caddisflies and they crawl along and they attach with their legs in the front and what are called anal prolegs in the back. And, you, and what happens is if you look to the left of the screen in this particular picture, you see the head and in the right of the picture you see is like the prolegs in the back that are enabling this creature to hang on to rocks even in very fast moving water. And they crawl along and scrape algae and diatoms and any leaf fragments that happen to be there. Okay, so. We also have some other guys that are doing the same kind of thing, but in a different way. They're crawling along the rock. They're a torpedo shape. Instead of having a, you know, kind of clamping on, they've got a torpedo shape that helps them survive in the, in the fast moving water. And they too will feed on particles that are on the surface of the rocks. The algae and diatoms are there as well as leaf fragments. And that's how, how they get these. Here is a picture of a creature that I, that is very abundant down in the Jim's, uh, Jim's Landing area of the Kenai River. Uh, this is a flattened creature. It's in the group the Heptogeneidae. Not that you needed to know, but it's a very flattened creature that presses itself up against the rock. So here you see two different uh, mayflies with two different approaches for being in fast water. One has a torpedo shape and one has a flattened shape. And that enables them to survive there. But notice the commonality is that one, they're all feeding on the same kind of stuff. They're crawling across the rock, feeding on the fine particles and the diatoms and algae that are there. Okay. Now, I have another picture. I don't know if this video clip is going to show up. This is another video that we're going to have to download and try and get it. This is a picture of that glossosomatid on a, on a boulder and he's crawling along very slowly and you can see him crawling and that's again one of these creatures that we just talked about that feeds on the diatoms, algae, and the fine leaf fragments that are on the surface of the rock. So we're hoping we're going to see that one as well. And also, if you do get to see that one, you'll see some other creatures in there, a worm-like creature that's a coronamid that I'll be spending more time with later on. All right, now there's other organisms that are going to be feeding on things in our stream. Uh, perhaps we could say they're grazing like cows because they're feeding mostly on the algae and the diatoms, okay? They're not worried with the leaf fragments. Now they're more interested in the algae and the diatoms. And there will be some things like some mayflies. This is an ephemerid mayfly, again, from the uh, upper river, of the Kenai River, but you can find them down here as well. And they go along and feed on algae and diatoms. Again, remember, we're interested in who's driving the system. Where is it coming from? In this case, these guys are getting their sustenance from the algae and the diatoms. We also have predators, and we could go on and on and talking about all these different categories, but let's just mention a couple predators because they're kind of interesting. There's a, s a couple small black uh, or what we call nemurid stoneflies. They're also known as winter stoneflies because they survive and actually come out. If you're in the lower 48, you'll find them emerging and crawling around in the wintertime. Now up here, what happens is they come out in May. And so if when you're seeing this, if it happens to be May, uh, do yourself a favor, walk down to the Kenai River and go s hang, out, hang out in some of the rocks and look for little black insects that are crawling around. They will look just like this. And uh, they are perhaps three quarters of an inch long. They're in this, what we call the, the winter stoneflies. And they are a predator down when they're in the stream and crawling around feeding on other small insects and other invertebrates, okay? Now there's some bigger predators there too. In some cases we have things like this one. This is a, uh, a small damselfly. These are the ones that you see flitting around the streams that look like they've got little black wings and they kind of when they, f when they land, they fold their wings up vertically. 
Okay, these are damselflies. They are voracious predators as larvae, or actually in this case we call them nymphs when they're in the, this youngest stage. And they're voracious predators on other invertebrates and insects. Another creature that's similar, this is a dragonfly nymph, and the dragonfly nymphs, uh, of course, are much bigger. This one actually uh, is perhaps an inch and a half long, and when it finally becomes an adult, it looks like this one. And these guys are your friends, by the way. They like to eat black flies and mosquitoes. They're really big on those guys, so they're my friends. Uh, but they are voracious predators as nymphs in the streams, and they are voracious predators when they're outside as well. Okay, So we've really kind of covered the whole gamut of what we have in terms of things going on in our stream. Uh, let, let's move on to a couple other ideas because we need to get a whole bunch of what seem like facts that are not really sticking together, but eventually they'll kind of hopefully come together and it'll make some sense. Insects are very inefficient in terms of their digestive tract. When I say inefficient, that means that they can digest away about 5% of what they take in. So if they take in a piece of an egg insect, they're only going to use 5% of it. If they take in a bunch of leaf fragments, they only use about 5% of it. Now that's kind of an interesting thing because what happens is it passes through their gut and there's 95% of the nutrition is still in that fragment that just went out the back end and started floating downstream. Now you're probably going to ask yourself, does somebody eat somebody else's? Yeah. Yeah, because it's nutritious. There's food source there, there's energy there, so someone else will use it. And in fact, we know that what these, we call them fecal pellets, will spiral downstream and get one organism will feed on it and pass it through its gut, and then another one will pass it through its gut. And you can do the math. It doesn't take long to figure out that, you know, it takes about 20 different guts to pass that, you know, for that particle to be down to next to nothing, okay? And, and so they are cycling, or what we call spiraling it, downstream. Now, you, this, these are perhaps the first recyclers, if you want to think of it that way. They are recycling. Uh, maybe you never thought about that, but, uh, you know, we do a lot of recycling. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the water, the water recycling, we do a lot of that. Look at the Mississippi River. The water that, that ends up going past New Orleans, by volume alone of what we've taken out of the the Mississippi River and put back in, that water that you have passing New Orleans has been through 20 toilets by the time it gets there. Okay, so we do a lot of recycling, okay? <laughs> Maybe you never thought of it that way. All right, let's move on to some other ideas. Streams are really dynamic. They're constantly changing. That's what this word means. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be harping on this one for a little bit, that they're always changing. I'm going to come back a couple times to the idea that they're changing. And those changes are things that you and I either suck it up and deal with it, or we utilize it to our benefit, and so on. And we'll see what we're talking about. Things are going to change like the gradient of a stream. Okay, How steep is it? Well, let's use an example of the Kenai River. Let's start at Cooper's Landing and compare that to what you find when you get below uh, Eagle Rock. You're going to find that the gradient has slowed down when you get to Eagle Rock, but it's really moving along pretty well up, up uh, right below the uh, outflow of the Kenai Lake. The discharge is going to change. Discharge now is quite different than what it is in July. In fact, we often think about, well, in the summertime, we're at the discharge levels that we normally see in July, and here we are in June or something like that. And this past fall, we had some high discharge events, and so the discharge was higher than what you'd normally expect it to be. And so discharge, the total amount of water traveling down uh, a river is going to change dramatically uh, over a bunch of different time frames. The energy source is going to change as well. You have leaves that are providing lots and lots of nutrients that come into the stream in the fall and they get broken down throughout the wintertime, but come springtime, they're gone. They're just stone cold, not there. I mean, I challenge you to go look for leaves in the stream in the springtime. They're just not there, okay? They've been processed. So that source has changed. And now we've got, you know, maybe you've got some bud scales coming in, maybe you've got some flowers coming in from trees and whatnot, but the, the sources have changed. The algae and diatom communities are changing as well. We find that the substrates will change again because of the creatures that are there, and we'll 
come back to some other ideas about that. Obviously, seasons change. That's a no-brainer. We don't really have to spend much time with that. But when you change any of these, we also have creatures that change. The creatures are different when you look in the stream today versus what you find at other times of the year. So if you go out and sample insects in the stream today, you'll find different ones than what you'll find sometime in, in say, midsummer. And in fact, we know that some of our insects go through a number of life cycles in a year's time. And so you might find mostly larvae at one time of the year, and then you find mostly uh, mature pupae later on, and then you're back to seeing tiny larvae again. So the organisms are going to change as well. And of course, we, you know, since we're talking about salmon and, and other fish, they're obviously changing too. You know, we don't have the young fish are smolting and leaving the, the stream uh, at certain times, and so that component of the fish population is now changed. Okay? So these parts, these organisms are changing as well as all of the other physical characteristics. So when you have a stream that goes from just a trickle or a splash coming down off of a rock face down to a, a large river that's kind of slow and, and meandering, uh, you know, there are changes in those streams as you go down from headwaters to uh, the mouth as well. And that's something that we're going to spend some time with in a little bit. Let's go on to some ideas that are kind of fun to play with. One of which is that riffles are more diverse than and they're more productive than pool areas of a stream. Now, when I say diverse, I'm talking about the number of species that are there, okay? I'm talking about the number of different species that are there, uh, and they are more diverse in riffle areas than they are in pools. Now, they also might be a little different. You might find certain organisms that just like to be in that pool area, and others that just like to be in the riffle areas. But the fact is, if I want to see what's in a stream, and I want to get a quick picture of what's in a stream, I'm going to go sample insects and invertebrates from that area, namely the riffle area. And of course, as I said, it's more diverse and more productive. Now, when I say productive, I mean that you have the more processing of organisms and the energy exchanges are going on more rapidly in that riffle area than they are in the pool. Uh, the question might be, why is it that the riffle is, has greater diversity? And the reason is that you have more microhabitats. Now that, again, seems like an esoteric idea, but let's think about this. If you are an insect and you like to be blasted by water moving past you at high rates of speed, then you want to be on a rock in the fast water getting beaten by that water, okay? If you happen to be an insect that likes a little bit of water but not quite as much, then you want to be on the side of the rock. If you want a little bit less, you kind of hide behind the rock. If you don't want any at all, you crawl under the rock. Okay? So where you have lots of different physical microhabitats for the organisms to live in, you're going to have more organisms utilizing those sources, those, those places to live. So those microhabitats being more diverse then means there's more physical spaces that they can occupy that make them happy Okay, that have the water movement that they want, that have the s food sur sources that they want, and so on. They're all going to be variable in different places, and that, of course, gives us the ability to have more species living there. Again, so the idea is when I go to a stream, I want to look in the riffle area. That's where I'm going to find the greatest number of organisms in terms of diversity, because I want to know who's there. Okay, so that's... One of the reasons that, of course, you might think, well, wait a minute, is that, how come there's not so many fish there? Well, the fish are feeding on the organisms that drift out. So the fish sit in the pool waiting for these organisms to drift out and they can feed on them. Although, you know, if you're a fly fisherman, you go out there and look for a rock that's creating a pool area, which is a place for the fish to hide, and the fish is sitting there hiding, waiting for things to get washed to him so they can feed on those insects that get washed downstream. Well, what I have here is kind of a summary of the things we've been talking about so far. If we look at the very top uh, of this particular little simplified food web, we're seeing that there are sources of energy. First of all, let's start with the diatoms and the algae that we talked about over on the far right-hand side. Those, again, are photosynthesizing, and they get fed on by certain groups of insects. 
and groups of other invertebrates. Then we have the emerging vegetation that we talked about. And that also gets fed upon by another group of organisms. And finally, we have on the left-hand side, you have the input from the riparian uh, trees and vegetation, the leaves and the, and of course, we don't have acorns as this diagram would show, but we do have uh, bud scales and we have uh, various types of, of seed pods, say from the alders and whatnot, that can come in and they will be broken down just as the leaves would be as well. And then you see, of course, a group that are shredders over on the left-hand side, and then in kind of the central of it, you see those particles are now broken up into little tiny pieces, and you have the collectors or those filter feeders, like the ones we showed you, the black fly larvae with their antennal fans, and of course, others that are utilizing these fine particles. Uh, and eventually, all of them end up being fed upon by the fish. Now this is a very simple little diagram and it shows the simplicity without trying to make it very complicated. The more organisms you have in a stream, the more complicated this food web becomes. Instead of being a nice little, you know, very simplest, simplistic diagram as I'm showing you to, you know, for kind of a learning purpose, understand that the more creatures you have, the greater the diversity you have, the more complex this food web is going to become. And that, incidentally, the more complex your food web is, the more stable it is. And that's a very important issue for us. The more it can withstand perturbations or changes that may come about. All right. This idea that I want to put before you now is that northern streams are going to be less diverse than southern streams. Now, we could be good down in the southern hemisphere and down in Patagonia, and we'd be looking at it and saying southern streams are less diverse than the northern the streams that are more mid-latitudes. That would work. But for our purposes, let's think about it from just the standpoint of, of things from the equator north, OK? So northern streams are less diverse. And being less diverse, it means that they're more vulnerable. But I want to give you an actual example. I work with a group of insects called the Coronamids, and I've worked on them from Venezuela all the way here to Alaska and all the way up to the above the Brooks Range. And I'm going to talk about the group of insects that I work with, the Coronamids. They are the most abundant creatures, or most abundant insects in any streams that you find anywhere in the world. And when I worked on some in, in Venezuela, we have had numbers of about 300 species in a separate stream. 300 species of coronamids in one stream. If we go further north to, let's go to the Appalachian areas, we have maybe 275 species in some of those streams. And let's go a little further north to Pennsylvania now, and we have 220 different species of coronamids in the streams. Let's keep moving into Canada now, and we have 175 in some of our uh, streams in around the Great Lakes area. Now let's move further north to, and, let's, and we're going to go to the west now because I don't have data for some of these other places, but let's look at Bend, Oregon. In some streams there, they have found 125 to 150 species. Now let's come to the Kenai River. In the Kenai River, we have 88 species of coronamids, and I know that because I did the research on that. And now if we keep going, let's go above the Brooks Range and go up to the Kaparic River. We have 21. So see what we've got. We went from 300 to 275 to 250 to 225 to 175 to 152, 88 to 21. As we go further north, the diversity decreases, OK? And that's not just the coronamids. We could, you know, we could spell out all the other insects that are there, too, and all the other invertebrates, and we would find that they are decreasing as well, OK? What that means is the less diverse you have, the more vulnerable your streams are. That means that you and I have to be much better stewards of our streams here than anywhere else in the country because our streams are more vulnerable. They are more easily disrupted and destroyed. Imagine if you were on the Kaparic River and you lose one species of coronamid, you've lost 4% of the coronamid population. Imagine if you were in Venezuela and you lost one out of 300, you know, you lost a third of a percent, okay? So we are doing more damage in our streams here when we do damage than you would be if you were uh, doing them somewhere else. We have a greater impact, and hence the reason that we have to be much better stewards. 
Okay, at this point, we would normally have questions, and so we're going to move on to a different, uh, a different uh, set. So we're going to take a break for a moment right now and change gears. <laughs>